All right, good morning, everyone. Um, oh, wait. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Kareem Black, um, and my producers, Jasmine and Kian, will be in the background keeping us operational and taking questions. Today, I'll be presenting on preparing for a sex successful HAZOP and LOPA, making or breaking quality and efficiency. Um, this paper was also presented at the GCPS conference earlier this year by me and my colleague Steve Marr. So if you would like to take a look at it after this presentation, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can get you a copy of that as well. This webinar series is a part of RMP's ongoing outreach program. Our core comp competencies and expertise reside in EPA RMP, OSHA PSM, CalARP, and SEMS program development as well as HAZOP and LOPA studies and various other hazard identification techniques. Today, I'll be going over several key topics, including the importance of a quality PHA, PHA history and regulatory requirements, defining objectives and approach, HAZOP LOPA planning, preparation and venue tips, and some final readiness tips. I'll conclude with a little summary, and then we can jump into the question and answer section. First, a brief history of key PHA techniques and regulatory requirements. Here I have a nice little timeline, a timeline of some of the major events in the history of process safety, um, but I did want to discuss one of the more notable incidents throughout history, which has really helped shape the process safety industry, um, this being the Bhopal tragedy, which occurred December 2nd, uh, 1984. It caused 3,928 3, fatalities and over 100,000 estimated permanent injuries. Uh, so it was a very significant event and it was consider considered a pivotal moment uh, in process safety history which drew the attention of industry, the public, and also regulatory communities to the potential consequences associated with process safety events. In response to this, ACWI actually swiftly uh, founded the Center for Chemical Process Safety in 1985. Um, CCPS is still really very prevalent in the process safety industry today. They have several guidebooks which are still considered key references for pro process safety. Um, and on top of that, we've been slowly developing more and more rigorous uh, regulatory requirements for process safety. However, throughout history, a key part of managing process safety has always been identifying and understanding potential hazards and their consequences. Um, this need to understand these hazards and consequences has pushed practical techniques for hazard identification, such as HAZOP and LOPA, really to the front line in an effort to manage process safety. And while there are several tools in the PHA toolkit that can be utilized for hazard analysis, um, such as what-if checklists, bow tie analysis, and so on, um, the team-oriented, patterned, brainstorming sessions associated with HAZOP studies are generally considered to be the workhorse of the industry and the most common, um, especially because you can fold in layer of protection analysis or LOPA into an integrated HAZOP study to provide some additional insights, um, some of which can be directly used for identifying appropriate reliability targets for key safety features, um, this being because it can provide you with a slightly quantitative approach to the HAZOP. And although the core of HAZOP approach hasn't really changed, HAZOP and LOPA applications have been evolving to accommodate higher expectations of both the regulators and also industry practitioners with respect to the quality and the level of detail. Um, HAZOPs and LUPAs must address and integrate some of the evolving regulatory requirements as well, especially in California as we're mandating more and more things such as application of SPA, damage mechanism reviews, hierarchy of hazard control analysis, and so on and so forth for all those California refineries. And to achieve all of this in one efficient study, it really does require a lot of planning and preparation. However, even before the planning, a clearly defined objective and approach will help streamline things as well. So, defining objectives and approach. The core objective for all hazard identification exercises such as HAZOP and LOPA is to uncover potential weaknesses and vulnerabilities in a system or operation that could result in undesirable out outcomes. These undesirable outcomes could be anything ranging from injury to environmental in impact, equipment damage, operational impact, 
or compromise company reputation. The specific focus beyond that of a HACCP can vary significantly from project to project. Um, for example, the focus of various capital projects is going to vary quite significantly from an operating facility that already has a process in place. Um, and even within that, a capital project will uh, have different objectives earlier in the stage, in earlier stages versus latter stages of the process. Um, and same for an operating facility, you're going to have a different approach to the HAZOP if it's an initial HAZOP versus just a revalidation. However, overall, the general overarching objectives for this HAZOP LOPA study would always be to identify potential safety, environmental, and operability issues, like I said, recommend vulnerability corrections and document bases, provide training to personnel, and also provide background and bases for the safety programs and procedures. I also wanted to dive a little bit more into the varying approaches so that you make sure to address each HAZOP in kind of a specialized way to make sure to get what you need out of each study. Um, these approaches can vary a lot by quality, um, team utilization and effectiveness, and session time. Um, the more efficient you are, the higher quality, faster, and just overall better product you can have in a HAZOP in LOPA. Um, and I also wanted to address the different approaches for capital projects versus operating facilities. So capital projects typically have fundamental design vulnerabilities that the HAZOP LOPA is being used to help resolve. Oftentimes, these projects have larger multidisciplinary teams with numerous stakeholders who wish to participate, some of which may be widely spread ge geographically, all of which have differing opinions and inputs that they want to add. Um, additionally, capital projects tend to encounter significant financial pressures um, to accelerate the project schedule, make sure you're on schedule, and also to work within the budgets of the projected project. Meanwhile, they also have significant financial impacts associated with design mistakes not caught during the HAZOP, which could lead to challenges later in the design process. So there are high stakes all being wrapped into a lot of um, financial impacts. So the early stages of the capital project really focus on uh, higher consequence scenarios to support decisions regarding fundamental design issues, especially because the earlier you address a potential design is issue, the cheaper it's going to be to fix it, make modifications, really perfect the design. Later on in the capital projects, uh, the objective really shifts more towards detail-oriented things as more and more process safety information becomes available to the team. Early on, you might not have much complete information, but in the later stages, you should be able to focus the project on finalizing and vetting design details with all that additional information. In contrast, operating facilities have very different objectives. The key focus for these is usually to meet regulatory requirements and also ensure that the process is operating sufficiently and within acceptable risk thresholds. There's a lot less focus on optimizing and simplifying the design as all this equipment has already been purchased and implemented, so it doesn't save the company much money necessarily. However, there are several additional items that need to be addressed in a operating facility that don't need to be addressed during the capital project phase. These are items such as incident investigation, management of change, facility siting, damage mechanism reviews, um, safeguard protection analysis, external events, and so on and so forth. Um, these studies typically involve much smaller teams, um, but they have individuals with a wider range of knowledge and experience with the process. Moving on to some how's up LOPA planning tips. Um, here I have a the nice um, timeline for you, sorry. Uh, and during week seven, the most important thing is to invite every team member and start scheduling things appropriately. If you don't get on these busy people early on, you're not going to get those key players that you really do need to have in these important sessions. You also need to define objectives and the scope early on so you have a well laid out timeline and are properly prepared. Week six, you want to conduct final uh, design reviews, especially for obviously capital projects. You want to make sure you have a good product going into the HAZOP study that's the most up-to-date version of what you're planning. For week five, we recommend doing a PNID walkdown and field verification. This is such an important step for operating facilities because if you're not working off of the most up-to-date PNIDs and they're not actually accurate, 
you might be missing some major potential hazards that are actually out there in the field, but not written down on paper. Week four, you want to arrange the PHA venue in a little bit. I'll go into more details about the types of things you want to look out for for a venue, but you do want to make sure that it's arranged relatively far in advance. Week three, you, would, you need to determine your PHA tools and also arrange for PHA meeting equipment, especially if you're doing any remote HAZOPs or including any remote team members. Beginning week two, you get a little bit more involved in the PHA prep. Um, start P prepping your PHA elements, resolving any final design review items, and also finalizing any revisions made to the PNIDs, PFDs, CNEs, and you start defining sections or noting. Week one is when you start preloading the risk ranking matrix, uh, start populating some causes, compile all your training and reference material and PSI information, and then make copies of the PNIDs and PFDs for every team member. Finally, you can get started with the study after you complete all of these items and are prepared. Moving on to some key disciplines useful for a HAZAP study. You need to have a facil facilitator, obviously, and a scribe. Important members are also process and project engineers, operations, maintenance, control protection, instrumentation engineers, HSE engineers, uh, rotating equipment specialists for the given system, and also any special specialists in unique requirements. These personnel involved do need to be knowledgeable in the design of their portion of the system, and know the dynamics of system response. They also have to very critically consider the response of their portions of the design to upset conditions. They do have to have a pretty thorough knowledge. You don't wanna just throw in some new hire who doesn't understand the system as well as say someone experienced. Uh, there's also a lot of value to including scribes. While the facilitator can be tasked with both facilitation and scribing duties, depending on various parameters of the HAZOP, such as complexity and team composition. Uh, for a relatively small manageable group, a facilitator can easily accommodate those duties. However, the pivotal decision-making parameter is whether an additional cost of a scribe outweighs the money saved by shortening the HAZOP section and subsequent documentation time. In most cases, we find that the financial threshold for when it's more convenient to use a scribe is once the team, excluding facilitator and scribe, exceeds about four individuals. Uh, that's for a local project, and for a project that involves a little bit more travel, it would be about one, when the team exceeds five individuals. That being said, you can't just use any given scribe to make the process faster. You really need to use a high quality scribe. Generally, that means being an engineering scribe. This scribe needs to know, have familiarity with HAZOP and LOPA techniques, familiarity reading engineering drawings, and familiarity with the software. Um, HAZOP and LOPA preparation tips. Some key information requirements that I have are process flow diagrams, PNIDs, cause and effects diagrams, alarm and PSV set points, um, and all kinds of other process safety information. A major setback for HAZOPs is actually the time spent looking up key information. And that valuable time can be spent focusing on the actual study as long as you are sufficiently prepared ahead of time. So things to consider compiling on top of the normal PNIDs and such are items such as MOC and PSSR documentation, previous PHAs, as well as their recommendations and their current status. Maintenance records, um, system descriptions, toxic chemical and physical properties, operating procedures, emergency procedures, and things like accident history. So really the more information you have up front, the better it's gonna be and the less time you're gonna spend running around looking for this stuff. You also wanna make sure this information is relatively thorough and accurate. Um, some common design information gaps in PNIDs are often if the equipment tag numbers are either not accurate or not there. You wanna make sure that the PNIDs include design specifications like temperature, or pressure, or material, and piping specifications as well, of course. For control valves, you wanna know more than just the actual location of the control valves. You wanna know their failure positions, how they're gonna to respond to a loss of air or a loss of power or hydraulic pressure or whatever it is. Um, you also wanna know their actuator type, size, set point, and so on. 
For pumps, you need to know what their blocked and discharge pressure will be, um, and you also want to know if reverse flow is possible, and also whether or not they have any auto start functions. And for block valves, you really just want to know their normal positions. However, it's very common for PNIDs to not properly document this and for it to get confusing, so it's good to have that information available. You also want to be prepared to discuss details going into this. For heat exchangers, you want to know what the impact of loss of heating or cooling or flow or temperature is going to be on the system, or something like loss of cooler fans. It's not going to be what it is supposed to be during a regular uh, process. You want to make sure to know how it's going to vary, basically. Um, for general process condition changes, you want to know how the process will react to loss of flow, more flow, high and lower temperatures. Um, and know the safety limits resulting in near or long-term damage. For instrumentation, you want to know the protection system set points as well as alarm set points and locations, um, and the alarm effects, whether or not they are audible, flashing lights, or so on. Finally, for tanks, you want to know the vent locations and any potential hazards affiliated with that. Uh, you want to know tank maintenance and draining and also secondary containment issues. Uh, as well as the secondary containment draining requirements, and also the materials of construction for all the tanks. I also have some interesting venue tips. I feel like this topic is widely ignored when you're preparing for a HAZOP. You're kind of under the impression that you can just throw together a room and it'll be perfectly fine. But there are actually some important factors to keep in mind when selecting a venue to make sure that it can help streamline the HAZOP process once you're there. First is location. While it would be very convenient to select a room that's just really easily accessible right in everyone's general normal area, that actually does have some fallbacks because it's very easy for people to get distracted by their day-to-day -day activities if they're too close in proximity to their normal locations. They can easily run off during breaks and work on their actual day-to-day -day stuff instead of focusing on the task at hand and staying in the mindset of the HAZOP study. Another consideration that people oftentimes don't address is team member distribution and room setup. We recommend that you have the facilitator right next to the screen with the scribe next to him, but you also want to consider the other key members of the team to make sure to get the maximum amount of uh, brainstorming and interaction between the team. So some key ways to do that are to take your most loquacious person or maybe one of your key players who's the project engineer or someone who's going to have to give a lot of input, put them on the other side of the table from the facilitator. So their involvement kind of draws in the rest of the team to also be included. In contrast, we always have that one guy on the team who'd rather be answering work emails on his phone than paying attention to the HAZOP study. You really want to get them involved because they do have thoughts and input that will matter for the HAZOP. So it's better to keep them close to the facilitator, really like force them to engage with the team. And then finally, venue amenities. Uh, some things you want to keep in mind are that having enough TVs or a whiteboard for quick brainstorming sessions, having coffee and snacks, um, even preparing lunch ahead of time so that you have enough um, Time not taken away from the actual study, you don't have people wandering off, and so on and so forth. We're also seeing more and more often the use of remote HAZOP and LOPA team members. Uh, with technology getting better and better, it's really easy to incorporate these people who maybe can't physically be present or even just aren't needed for most of the study, so it's not worthwhile to bring them over there. It's easy to incorporate these team members as long as you do sufficient preparation ahead of time to make sure that there aren't any hiccups with the technology. So things to keep in mind are to make sure that you have adequate computers and displays. Oftentimes you need an extra one to make sure that you can st stream everything to the remote person that is necessary, even if it's PNIDs or so on. You also want to arrange communications with IT support to make sure that if there are any issues, they can be rectified pretty quickly so that they don't detract from important HAZOP study time. And of course, you want to make sure that all of this equipment is working. So the most easy way to do that is to just test it ahead of time. That extra prep will really make sure that the actual session time goes smoothly. So these are just my final readiness tips. 
Uh, one is that you want to predefine causes. Uh, there are some controversy about that, whether or not it detracts from the actual brainstorming of the session. However, when used efficiently, it will actually streamline the session so more time can be focused on the important hazardous scenarios instead of struggling through the cookie cutter scenarios that aren't as important. This also helps with completeness because if you're going through these PNIDs in a methodical order ahead of time, uh, you're less likely to overlook something during session. It also helps keep things well organized for one, locating things on the fly, assuming that these causes were properly tagged and have the PNID numbers on them. And they're also more useful for future revalidations. If it's well organized, causes are grouped in an appropriate logical manner. Um, it makes for a more complete hazard moving forward that it's a better tool to use. And also predefining questions. It's obvious that the facilitator should do their homework, have a couple questions for the team going in if they have any concerns looking at the PNIDs. But this also means that the rest of the team should be doing their homework too. They ought to go into the study knowing the types of potential deficiencies that they've seen, whether it be uh, during the prep phase or during actual operations. They want to go in with any questions or concerns they may have to make sure as a team they can be addressed during session. Um, but it's definitely better to look at those things ahead of time. So in conclusion, the goal for any HAZOP is to optimize the quality and efficiency. You don't want to be there for any longer than you have to, but you do need a high quality product that addresses all of the issues. For capital projects, the focus should be on optimizing process design, especially as early as possible because it'll minimize costs of changing things later on. And you also want to minimize design and operation costs and minimize startup challenges. For operating facilities, the goals are to mitigate risk, minimize vulnerabilities, and also, of course, address the regulatory requirements. For, to, to be able to receive all of this uh, success, you want to really schedule in advance. That means finding the optimal venue that has all those items that I mentioned earlier and also make sure that all those key team players are scheduled for this HAZOP well in advance so that their busy schedules can't conflict with these HAZOPs. And also, I can't stress enough how important it is to obtain the necessary PSI information ahead of time. It really does save the team a lot of stress and time running around looking for information if it's compiled ahead of time. And also to compile pre-causing and also some questions ahead of time so that you're prepared going into the session and have a good idea of uh, what the focus needs to be. Doing all these items will really help you maximize HAZOP and LOPA investments. Moving forward, uh, that's the end of my presentation, but I did want to let you guys know that there are a couple webinars coming up to look forward to. In September, we're going to be doing one on CalArt Program 4, Incorporating Inherently Safer Design into HTAs, presented by Jasmine Dollywall. Sometime in the fall, we'll give you a date closer to the date, but it'll be on NFPA 86 and API 556, Meeting Safety Standards for Gas-Fired Heaters, presented by John Johnson. And then finally, we're also going to be at the IIAR conference later this year, and Stephanie Smith will be presenting on what are CalArt Program 4 and Cal OSHA 5189.1, and why should I care? So hope to see you guys out there at any of those events. Um, and now I can go on to take questions. All right, uh, doesn't look like there's any questions, so thank you for being with me today. <laughs>